and welcome back to Otaku no Video. As always, thank you very much for joining me. Apologies for any audio issues this time. I'm having some microphone issues, but wanted to get this out to you. Today I'm reviewing Deno Coil, and you'll see a couple different spellings of this depending on where you look for the anime. It is available domestically in the U.S. and North America, um, subbed and dubbed. Deno Coil is an unusual show. The best way I can think of to describe it is Serial Experiments Lane as made by Hayao Miyazaki. And I know that's a bold statement, and it's a little over the top, but bear with me on this. The basic concept of Deno Coil is it's set in the near future of augmented reality implemented ubiquitously in various cities in Japan. And so the idea is that you would buy a pair of eyeglasses that contain in those glasses um, screens, and there's a little microphone and speaker in the glasses. So they are an augmented reality device. You put those on, and then you can see various digital representations of things. So somebody might be walking a dog that is just digital. Take off the glasses, there's nothing there. Put the glasses on, and you see the dog. And the glasses take care of all that stuff. Now, no augmented reality system will be perfect. So, you can make a little money by finding these imperfections in the system. Finding places where the augmented reality images don't quite overlap correctly. Where, um, you know, avatars aren't behaving correctly. The bounties are small enough that, you know, adults don't really care, but that's really great spending money for kids. So the show is all about these various children, grade school age children, who run around after school looking for these things. And of course, things get a little more complicated as the story continues. One of the things that's, that's great about this is it's a 26 episode TV series. So you get to really spend time with these characters. There are about, I would say, 10 main named characters that you follow through the, the story, and then another I would say, dozen or more significant side characters. And they are all distinctive. They all feel real. We'll get more to that um, uh, in a second. But this is a story where you're going to spend time with these characters as opposed to it being this constant rush of, of events. This is not something where you're going to be um, trying to breathlessly to keep up with the plot. A lot of stuff happens, but it's a little bit more leisurely paced. Uh, the animation is worth mentioning here. The director of Deno Coil is better known as a uh, very well-known animator in anime. He worked on the final fight in the Ghost in the Shell movie between Meiji Kusanagi and the tank. Uh, he worked on the opening credit sequence of Rurouni Kenshin TV. Uh, he's done a number of different things, and he's known for this kinetic style of animation where characters, you know, lean to one side and then lean to the back. And there's just a lot of, of very realistic movement, but it is this almost jagged movement where there's um, uh, a lot, you know, going on in the animation, but it's not the, the butter-smooth animation of Disney, of Disney where characters have this balletic style. Um, it is this reacting in the moment style, where somebody who is trying to deal with a lot of stuff, and he runs over here, then it runs over there. It's that, that kind of thing. And he directed this, this series. Unfortunately, there wasn't much time to see his actual animation. When you're directing something, you can't actually draw a lot. So you don't see a lot of that style in the show. It just pops up here and there. But because he's an animation person, because he's an animator, a lot of attention is paid to the movements of the characters. This has a very naturalistic style, much more like that of, say, a Miyazaki or a Ghibli. Obviously, they don't have the budget of a Ghibli film, but the way the characters move, the way the characters jump, the way the characters crouch, all of these things feel real. They feel natural. Um, this does not have the odd stylization of a typical anime series, and this is important for the show. This is about real people interacting with this digital fantasy world, um, although it's not a fully realized, you know, fantasy world, but they, they, all of these things that they're interacting with, they don't actually exist. 
So you need that more realistic movement to sell the fact that these are real people, right? They can't leap 20 feet in the air like almost every other anime character can. So the overall um, direction of the show has this real-world pace. This is about kids around 10, 11, 12 years old. Uh, and so they have that, that feel to them where they have a lot of spare time and they, they spend it hanging out. And they have all of these typical problems that you have as a grade schooler dealing with grade school problems. A lot of them are trying to grow up. A lot of them are trying to figure out who they are as people. And so the show gives them time to breathe. When there's action, the action moves at a pretty fast pace. It's not breakneck. It's always very clear what's going on. Um, but this is closer to a slice of life show than to an action show. And I think that works for this show and their pacing. It's not a slice of life show. Uh, it's one of those weird shows that kind of does everything all at once. There's comedy, there's action, there's uh, there's drama, there's character development, there's even a little bit of, of little bit of romance between some of the characters and some crushes here and there. But the overall pacing um, is very steady and very very measured throughout the show, which for a first-time director is quite impressive. Now a show like this um, really lives and dies based on its characters. The main character of Deno Coyle is this girl who is a very traditional female uh, you know, tween girl protagonist. She is pretty qu quiet, she is very polite, she knows how to behave in social situations, and she generally defers to others. Without getting into spoiler territory, um, it's revealed that that, well, it's not even revealed, um, it turns out that there's more to her character than that. Um, she is not just your typical Yamato Nadeshko style anime girl, um, she has a past. There's a reason why she's acting this way. And this is true for most of the characters in the show. They all have behaviors. They all have history that informs why they behave the way they behave. And in many cases, they do evolve and change somewhat over the course of the show. Some don't, um, and some do learn better ways of behaving as the show goes on. Um, that said, I never found any of the characters annoying or irritating to watch. Often in these shows, in order for a character to get to a better place, you have to watch them be annoying for 20 episodes. The show does not have that problem. Um, the, the characters are sometimes immature, sometimes make immature choices, but it's always in an entertaining and interesting way. So that's always you know, impressive. Now I mentioned before how grounded this show is. It's very important for the show to feel like you're in the real world, but where there are these digital things, you know, around to interact with. When watching the show, not only do you always know that, one of the, the smart things they do is that the digital things are typically animated with a slight filter over them. So if you're watching, you will notice what's digital and what's not. And this gives you some clues as the plot progresses as to what's actually going on with, this, with the characters and what actually is real and what isn't. This is one of the things that really impressed me about the show, is I felt like these characters existed. I believed their reality. This felt like a very prescient, a very believable near future. Which is, again, very impressive to, to take something this um, like this and... By the way, this show was made in 2007, 10 years ago, as of my recording of this review. So AR was not around. VR was a pipe dream, right? VR was a failed technology when Deno Coil was made. And this feels like they, they understand all the issues and all of the, the elements about it. Um, I also need to bring out something else important here that um, gets back to my earlier statement. It's fun watching a show like this and recognizing the influences, recognizing where the show came up with a lot of its ideas. Um, Deno Coyle feels like it's very inspired by Serial Experiments Lane. 
in that it is about a world in which the the internet and the physical world are overlapping and there are places where they are overlapping poorly and where things can kind of leak out into each other um, because of the, these bugs and these errors. But also some of the deeper themes of Lane show up in Deno Coil. These questions of fantasy versus reality, of how much time you spend in the digital world and what are the proper limits of that. And also, can something in the real world touch us as much as, as something in the physical world? Um, should you care as much about something digital as something physical? Um, and we're talking about, like, characters. Can you care for an NPC in a video game as much as you care for, you know, your sibling? Is that natural? Is that right? Is that reasonable? And the show really delves into that from multiple perspectives. There are some other sort of twists in there as well. What's also interesting is that there's a character in this show who seems to me like a... She is pulled very much from Boogie Pop Phantom, the strange horror anime and larger Boogie Pop franchise from the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, uh, Nagi Kirima, the Fire Witch from Boogie Pop Phantom, seems like is a strong inspiration for one of the, the girls in this show. Um, so if you've seen Boogie Pop, if you've heard about it, I, I think you'll, you'll see that connection and, and have fun seeing how those things uh, kind of work. I do want to give a quick shout out to the English dub. Um, it's tough casting an anime series where most of the characters are children because it's hard for adults to sound like children, believably over 26 episodes, and they do. Um, they have an energy to them, they have a freshness and a, um, not even an innocence, but a, a directness to them that kids have. I spent a fair amount of time dealing with kids um, and they just, they just felt right. Some of the voice actors you will definitely recognize, some of them you will not. And I think they did, you know, overall a, a fine job with the voices, particularly Hilary Hogg, or Hilary Haig, as the main character. Um, she just, she felt right, exactly right for the role. And I think the other, the other voice actors, they just settle down and they figure out how to, how to do those voices. Just, um... There are some cases where some of the minor characters, some of the minor, minor kid characters, sound like the voice actor is pushing themselves a little bit too much, where the voice sounds appropriate and like the emotions are there, which is the exact tenor of the voice, you know, kids who have voices like this, where like, I know kids who sound like this, um, but it just feels a, like they're reaching a little bit too much for an odd voice. So be aware of that, you know, going in. Um, Granted, what I've seen, I watched about half of this with the Japanese dub and half with the English dub, and as I recall, the Japanese dub does similar things, just the American um, brain that usually doesn't know what a, Japanese, a different Japanese voice sounds like. We're not as attuned to an odd Japanese voice, typically. So some of them do some odd things with the voice, which just don't, they sound different, but they don't sound odd, right, to our, our ears. So as I recall, this was just a, a, a choice made by the team. Um, so, in other words, I'm not calling out the American team for being a bad choice. I think it was just something that, they, that was done uh, on both sides. But again, nothing to break you out of the show. Nothing to, nothing that seemed bad. All the voice actors hit their correct emotional marks. It just sounds a little, um, um, a little unusual at times. And note, that's about the only complaint I have about the show. Now, certainly, Dental Coil is not for everyone. Um, it's a quieter show, it's a more contemplative show. Um, there is action, there is drama. People do change. Bad things happen. But this is not a show about characters firing, you know, um, giant laser guns that they pull out of their bodies at each other. You know, this is not about characters punching each other. This is about 11-year-olds who are, get caught up in something much bigger than themselves. The plot does go in serious directions, and there is dark stuff that happens later on in the show. Um, so be aware of that, that you know, a tear may come to your eye now and again. And I think that's exactly right. This is the kind of anime that I want to see more of. It is 
It is quality. It is doing something, not just doing something different, but it is committed to a distinctive, specific story and theme and setting, and it executes on that. This fe Everything feels like it fits here. Everything feels like it was designed exactly for this world and for this setting to tell these things. And we just don't see that that often in anything, in any medium. And it's just so wonderful and so refreshing. As I mentioned, you can find this uh, uh, dubbed and subbed with legitimate, re with legitimate re releases over here. Um, I hope more people do support this show because I think this is the kind of thing that we would do well to have more of. Hope this is helpful. Thank you for watching. Hope to see you next time.